and welcome to the Word of Truth, the Sunday School Class of the Air with your teacher, Rod Payne. The Word of Truth. Thanks for joining us today, this afternoon, this evening. Whenever you're watching the Word of Truth, thank you so much for joining us here on the program as we begin a brand new study in the book of Acts. A brand new month, the month of June in the year 2024, and a brand new study, the book of Acts. I hope you have already had the opportunity to look at this first week's lesson, if not several of the week's lessons, in your quarterly. If you have not done so, please at least turn in your Bible to the first chapter of the book of Acts, where we'll be camping out today. But before we get to today's time in the Bible, let's take a little bit of time to celebrate everybody a happy birthday that's having, to celebrate with everyone that's having a happy birthday near the first of the month of June. So happy, happy birthday to you. I pray God's richest blessings upon you and yours. If you're celebrating an anniversary around the first month, of, or rather the first part of June, happy anniversary to you. There are a lot of June brides. Maybe some of them are watching this program today. So if you're a June bride, happy wedding anniversary to you. If on the other hand, as I'm always fond of saying, this time in the year brings to your heart a remembrance or memories of those who have gone on before. I pray that you know Jesus Christ. And my prayer is that they know him, not knew him past tense, but know him as well. And that you have the expectancy that you can look forward to a great reunion one day when the entire body of Christ, the assembled body of Christ, will gather together. And we know that Jesus is our Lord and Savior, and I pray that you know that as well, and that you have a peace that passes all understanding. God has certainly been walking through this time with my family, and uh, we continue to greatly appreciate your prayers, and uh, continue to appreciate your prayers for all of the various situations that God is allowing us to go through. And remember, I say God is allowing us to go through because nothing that occurs in our lives is not filtered, sifted, if you will, through his hand. So there's nothing that's taking place in my life and my my wife and I, Vicki's lives, in our family's life, certainly in my health. Nothing is taking place that God has not allowed to take place. And I've also said this many times on this program, but I think it bears reiteration God does allow us to have more in our lives than we can handle. That's a, that's a totally false statement when someone says, God won't allow more in your life than you can handle. That's not true. But as I'm always fond of saying, He won't allow more in your life than He can handle. And we are certainly seeing His faithfulness, and we continue to just so appreciate all of your prayers. Speaking of prayer, if you'd like to write to us to let us know how we may pray for you, we would love to hear from you. The address you see on the screen is the address where you may write to us. The Word of Truth, 1200 Ninth Street, Wichita Falls, Texas. The zip code is 76301. That address again is the Word of Truth, 1200 Ninth Street, Wichita Falls, Texas. And the zip code is 76301. I can't help but feel like there are some new folks or some new viewers for our program. And I want to say welcome to you. And I also want to say we would love to hear from you. Now, if you'd prefer not to write a letter, we would love to hear from you by phone. You can call us during normal business hours, Monday through Thursday, or on Friday mornings at 940-723-2764. That number again is 940-723-2764. And please ask for the media department. If no one's present to answer the phone, if we're running around the building or if we're here in the studio, if I'm here in the studio and some of the crew is here in the studio as well, putting these programs together, please leave a message. We will be faithful to return your call. But we would love to have the honor to be able to pray with you, for you, or for someone else for whom you care. I and all of the team very, very much appreciate your prayers And you're ongoing just lifting this program up before the throne of God. Well, as I mentioned, here we are beginning a brand new study in the book of Acts. The book of Acts, written by Luke. Its authorship by Luke has not really been very widely contested down through the ages in the history of the church. There are several things that would attribute it to Lukean authorship. 
in addition to his addressing his dear friend, the most excellent Theophilus. I may be pronouncing that wrong, so I'll just call him Theo. He's addressing his dear, respected friend, Theo. But in addition to that, as you know, he begins Luke with that same salutation. In addition to that, we also know that he is drawing on the eyewitness accounts and, and the sources that he has to use to reflect what takes place and what took place, rather, in the life of Christ. Now, down through the history of what we call textual criticism, which means uh, a form of Bible study where often, even though these are very learned people, they try to poke holes in the inerrant and in the inspired Word of God. Not always, not always. I shouldn't lump all textual critics together. But down through the ages in the history of that particular discipline of Bible study, there have been those who have tried to point to uh, maybe Luke having read... Josephus' Antiquities. If you're not familiar with Josephus in the Antiquities, it is what we call an extra-biblical source. It is something that is outside the Bible and yet very closely, in fact, very strongly supports uh, Scripture in its just reflection of Roman history. It doesn't really have a, a, a um, presupposition of being written by a believer, not at all. And it really doesn't come from a dispensation that would say this was written as an uh, inspired word of God, not even remotely. But it is one of the oldest works that we have. And yet, remarkably enough, it talks about, not remarkably, God knew what he was allowing to have happen. It talks about Jesus, that Josephus Antiquities. And it's a remarkable work. It's very, very large. It's not something you want to read for, um, you know, pleasure reading in the evening before you fall off into sleep or something like that. Very, very large volume, but studied exhaustively by those who study God's Word because, again, outside of the Bible, it still points to the historicity of the events described within the Bible. Not all of them, obviously. But some of them. And so for that matter, it's really encouraging to the Bible student. And it could be encouraging to those of us who just have faith in Christ and are not. I don't consider myself even remotely a Bible scholar. But down through the ages, there are those who have tried to say that Luke, and I'm reading from a wonderful commentary uh, edited by F.F. F. Bruce, and it's called the International Bible Commentary. And I've had this volume in my library for almost 40 years, a long, long time. And um, it's just a wonderful commentary on God's Word. But E.H. Trinchard wrote this particular uh, section of the commentary talking about the book of Acts. And he talks about how there were those who tried to point to Josephus and other things. One of the things that they try to use to date the book for the writing of the book would say, during this writing, as you read the book of Acts, it doesn't seem as though the church of Christ is under the intense persecution that would have fallen, or rather would have uh, come after Nero. And Nero, we know, to have been around the time of A.D. 64, 65, somewhere in there. So we don't think uh, Nero is in power. We know that Nero, of course, tried to blame the burning of Rome on that small new sect or this small relatively new uh, religious order called Christianity or, or Christians. So we think it probably predates that, but it certainly comes post the ascension of Christ. So some scholars, a lot of scholars basically, look at that and say this is probably the date where Luke writes the book of Acts. And we also know that Luke is the author of the book that bears his name, the book of Luke. I loved this particular quote, and I marked it in my commentary because I wanted to read it to you this morning. In speaking about Luke, a commentator in the International Bible Commentary on the book of Acts writes these words, God chose a man of culture with a wide interest in contemporary history a master of excellent Hellenistic Greek, a fine storyteller, and an exact historian to write a wonderfully selective account of the great happening from the birth of John the Baptist until Paul's first imprisonment in Rome. We know that Luke's gospel reflects those things early on all the way to the end of the book of Acts. The Acts, as it's formally known, of the Apostles 
reflects the fact that this work talks about what's transpiring as the church is growing. As the church is going on beyond the confines of the limited geographic area where it was first founded by those who follow Christ, as it begins to permeate, to move out about into the then Roman Empire of that particular geographic locale. We know that Paul eventually does go to Rome because he is uh, being accused of something, and we'll talk about that to some degree or with more greater degree much later. But we know that Paul is accused, and when standing accused, he appeals to Rome, and it was the right of a Roman citizen to do so. Paul originally saw Jesus speaks to him on the road to Damascus and says, Why are you persecuting me? And he comes to an understanding and a faith in Jesus Christ and counts himself among the apostles, though he certainly was not among, not numbered among the original 12 that we find in the four Gospels. But he felt every bit as strong a call. And the word brought forth, inspired by God through him, certainly gave evidence to that, as well as God using him in a miraculous, in a number of miraculous ways to further the kingdom. So here's the author, Luke. There's approximately the date of authorship. There's pretty much the purpose. Well, the purpose is this. You find it in verse 1 of chapter 1. In my former book, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up into heaven. After giving instructions to the Holy Spirit, to the apostles, he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. One more time, Luke is trying to say, here's what's happening, or here's what happened. And let me give you a wonderful meticulous and accurate, yes, but also succinct account of what transpired. So we see that we have Luke authorship. We see about the period of time in which it was written. We got an understanding of the purpose of the, of the writing. Luke is an apologist. Now, what do I mean by that term? Well, you might think he's someone who goes around and says, I'm sorry all the time, but no. When we talk about someone who practices the is an apologist, there's someone who defends the faith vigorously, intelligently, and without fear. And so Luke serves as an early apologist. Uh, if you watch CF&T very often at all, you'll see someone like John Ankerberg, who might be considered a modern-day apologist because he looks at all the various things that people try to believe or that people even do believe, and he compares them to the Scripture. He compares them to God's truth, and he says, here's where they fall, here's where God stands, here's where God's truth stands. Without any question, this is how God's truth stands. So Luke is, 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 is writing from that viewpoint. And he's also showing us what transpires. It's kind of a transitional period, if you will, between those who are following Christ and then see him crucified and then experience him raised from the dead, then see his ascension. He shows the transitional period between that early uh, version of Christianity, if you will, to the beginnings of the establishment of missionary work and the establishment of the early church. Now, this one to whom Luke is writing, he's described as basically his name means, and I wanted to look that up so I have it for you here in my commentary, his name means friend of God. And the author here of the commentary, as well as do others, believe that he's probably someone who's very high up, perhaps in the Roman affairs, and as such, he's either very interested in what's going on with this one called Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ, or he himself may have already converted. But as Luke writes this writing, he's saying to not only him, but down through the ages to you and to me and to anyone with ears to hear and to anyone who's willing to read with an open mind, these are the things that transpired following the ascension of Jesus Christ. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Let's see what happens. 
So I read to you the first few verses of chapter 1. After his suffering, verse 3, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs he was alive. We know the word of God reflects that he, were, he not only appeared to the 12 or to the 11 that were left, but he appeared to 500 at a time. He appeared to a number of folks. So on one occasion while he was eating, verse 4, with them, he gave them this command, don't leave Jerusalem. But wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. John baptized with water. That's talked about in the word. John baptized with water. But in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, we're going to talk about it a little bit this week. We're going to talk about it in great detail in chapter 2 of the book of Acts next week. But down through the ages, certainly in the last hundred years or maybe a couple of hundred years, there's been a great deal of controversy concerning this term, concerning what does it mean in the life of a believer. Is it necessarily reflective of the way some in some denominations would um, present it as being the only authentic way to discern whether or not someone has accepted Christ? There's a lot of discussion about this term. But let me just share with you. If you've, if you've received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three entities in one entity. Okay? I don't understand the Trinity, and I've said that on more than one occasion. I am not the sharpest tool in the drawer, but trust me when I tell you, I sure don't understand the Trinity. But I know this. They are three in one, and while they may have separate actions... And while they may have certainly separate authority, because remember Jesus placed himself under the Father, and yet he and the Father, as the Word says, are one. Okay? So while I don't understand it, and I do get this much of it, they are three entities in one representation. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have received the Holy Spirit. I want you to hear me now. Yes, you may come into a deeper understanding of his walk and his will and his working in your life. Yes, you may. And, and many, many people do. I myself personally have. But you need not have the same experience as some would say you must have in order to fully know that you're a believer in Jesus Christ. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Okay? There's no um, riddle here. There's no hoops to which you much are with, through which you must jump. Rather, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And body of Christ, that means you. If you've asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, if you've confessed your sin and believed in your heart, if you've confessed with your mouth and believed in your heart that Jesus is God and He's been raised from the dead, you are saved. And once having been saved, you've received the Holy Spirit. But you want to have a deeper more full understanding and allow him to work even greater in your life. And that, I think, is what some might describe as that baptism of the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, verse 6, they asked him, Lord, are you going to this time going to restore the kingdom? He said to them, it's not for you to know the day or the time. The Father has set his own authority, but you'll receive power. That's one of the things about knowing the Holy Spirit better. You're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And after that, he was taken up before their very eyes. And they're looking up in the sky and two men dressed in white, angels, men of Galilee. They say to them, why do you stand looking in the sky? The same Jesus who's been taken up from you to heaven will come back. And he is going to come back. Are you ready? He is coming back. Could be before this program ends. Do you know him? They returned to Jerusalem from the hill. They selected a guy to be the one to take the place of the one who betrayed Christ. They selected someone to take the place of Judas. They joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, with his brothers. Verse 15, in those days, Peter stood up among the believers. There was about 120 of them and said, Brothers, Scripture has to be filled, which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago in the mouth of David concerning Judas, who served as a guide who, for those who arrested Christ. He, he was one of our number, and he shared in the ministry. And he died a very uh, awful death, but 
He betrayed Christ, and this is what happens. They chose one to replace Judas, and now they're back to full strength. And before you know it, they're going to be doing some amazing things, and God is going to be doing them through them. But we need to understand this. When one goes, another one can come. And another one will come to take the place of the one who's gone. Sometimes we're under the impression that when a ministry loses uh, any integral entity or uh, figure or figurehead, that that ministry is over. And on occasion, that has happened. Especially where the ministry is so centered around that individual and the gifts that God has given them that it seems impossible to carry on without them. That's why it's dangerous sometimes for an entity to be promoted to a point where everyone believes that they somehow or another are responsible for what God is doing in and through the ministry. We still see the late Reverend Billy Graham on television today and his messages have everybody as, as much vitality and they're, they're every bit as much, uh, they have as, the same impact today often as that they had when they were being delivered years and years and years, sometimes years and years and years ago. Because it wasn't Billy Graham, it was God working through Billy Graham. When Keith Green passed away, um, Last Day's ministry, the ministry that, that he and his wife Melody had founded and God had given them the vision for, um, literally, it, it struggled, struggled for some time and really has never re- regained the same kind of momentum that, that they had uh, when he was living. But so much, so many of the eggs in their basket were placed. And and I don't believe it was wrong to do so. I believe God was all over Keith Green. I met him personally. I know him to have been a man, strong man of God, who this day is in heaven. But so many of the eggs in that basket of the last day ministries were placed and, and, and gone around Keith. And so after his passing, tragically in a plane crash that took not only his life, but the lives of several of their children, Melody was still on the ground with some of the younger, if not one or two of the younger children. But Keith perished in the plane crash along with some friends and a, and a good, good, all of them are good people, but a great guy uh, who was the pilot of that plane. And that, that caused trouble. On the other hand, I've seen ministries where the leader of that ministry passed the torch on and remains to help in some way, but the ministry continues strongly to this day. John, John Hagee Ministries uh, in San Antonio, remarkable how long he filled that pulpit of that church and how he stands with Israel to this day. But when it came time for him to not be as active in the ministry and in the pulpit, his son took the mantle. In the same way, Billy Graham's son, uh, Franklin, has taken his father's mantle, has, has have several of his daughters uh, in writing and in speaking. No one, yes, has the same just God call in their life as did their father, Billy Graham. But to some degree and in some way, the ministry continues. There were some that might have thought, well, what's going to happen now? Uh, because one of the guys was terrible. He was a no good person. I don't, he betrayed Christ. Uh, does this mean that there's a systemic issue? That, that Could there be pathology within the ranks? It wasn't the case. Now, how did they derive who they were going to select? Because there were two names that were basically before them. Uh, but verse 21 says that it was necessary to choose one of the men who's been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with John's baptism till today. One of those must be a witness with us of his resurrection. So it had to be someone who was there on the, in on the ground floor. He was not a part of the inner circle, but he was in on the ground floor. They proposed two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, uh, and then also a justice, they also called him that, or Matthias. They prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these two you've chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs, referring to his uh, demise in that field uh, that he had purchased with the blood money of having sold out Jesus. They cast lots. Oh, there would be people who would say even today, wait a minute. You're telling me basically they threw stones, the same kind of stones that would have been found in the breastplate of the high priest. They threw stones or they cast lots. In other words, it was by uh, roll of the dice, if I can use a colloquialism, that they determined 
They were seeking God. And they used the methodology that God had approved. I am not advocating that if you have a major decision in your life that you say, if it's six dots on the die when I throw it against the kitchen floor or the wall, then that means I'm supposed to take this action. If it's five, this, four, you know, I'm not advocating that in any, or by any stretch of the imagination. This was how God used this time in this part of the history of his interaction with man to say, this is whom I would have you use. This is the one I want you to set apart now to join your inner circle. That doesn't, by the way, next week when we talk about just Pentecost and just the wow that takes place in the second chapter of Acts, I want you to note that it's not 12 that receive that amazing gift, but it's Everybody, it's like 120 people that get that amazing gift that God bestows upon His followers. So, please hear me when I when I when I stress to you: these 12 had the opportunity to be very close in proximity to learn daily from Jesus. But they are not the only ones who will, and not the only ones who can. Hear me again, Christ's followers. Hear me again, Church. These 12 had the wonderful opportunity to be close in proximity to Christ and to hear from Him, but they are not the only ones who will be given, who have been given those privileges because you and I, you and I, there, I got it backwards. You and I also have that privilege. If He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, doesn't that mean He's right here with us? Yes, it does. If He says to us, read my word and obey, and if you obey... You're truly a follower of mine, and you know if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. All of these things point to the fact that you and I can have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And no, I'm not Saul turned my name to Paul, but I can know Jesus Christ on an intimate, daily, refreshing basis where he can sow and does so into my life, his truth through the ministry of his Holy Spirit, and he gives me life anew. Next week, the second chapter in our new study in the book of Acts, but as always, I want to remind you, you can write to us at the Word of Truth, 1200 9th Street, Wichita Falls, Texas. Our zip code is 76301. That address again, the Word of Truth, 1200 9th Street, Wichita Falls, Texas. The zip code is 76301. Or you can call during normal, normal business hours, 940-723-2764. We'll see you again next week here on The Word of Truth. See you then. You've been watching The Word of Truth from First Baptist Church, Wichita Falls. Join us again next week for The Word of Truth 